Um, Dr. Shah, thank you very much for doing this. We've been, we've been, uh, been trying, gee, for, probably for 10 months trying to do this. So I'm glad we finally can. Um, and I wanted to be able to ask you, lots of people wonder about you. I mean, you're the face. You probably never imagined when you took this job that you'd be the face of a pandemic. <laughs> you know, you're right. And um, the, the fact is, though, Don, this is the reason why folks elect to go into governmental or state public health, not because they aspire to be uh, at, the, at the forefront of a pandemic, but rather uh, what governmental public health is really all about, what your state health department does is prepare for and respond to crises, whether it's a global pandemic or whether it's the opioid crisis or a natural disaster. This is what emergency preparedness and response is like. And this is why folks elect to go into it. It's so that when things are bad, when the chips are down uh, and folks are relying upon us to be prepared and ready, we are ready to do so. It's why I elected to go into this position in the first place. And it's an honor to be able to serve alongside so many other dedicated public health professionals. So having said that, a year ago, how ready were you and I guess the folks you directly work with for this? And did you ever imagine that a year later you'd still be doing it? Well, you know, when we, when we first start, I'll start talking. I'm going to say that over. Well, Don, I'll start by discussing our preparedness and then our eventual response. Uh, because of work that I had done uh, when I was early in my career in Southeast Asia, almost 20 years ago now, I, I, I still was able to keep up with many of the colleagues that I worked with back in Southeast Asia and Asia way back when. And in December of 2019, I started getting emails and, and notices on listservs of a type of pneumonia that had been detected in central China that didn't seem to align with any other type of pneumonia that was known at the time. And it immediately set off alarms for many of us who had worked in Asia at that time because it sounded a lot like SARS, the mm -hmm. global outbreak caused by another coronavirus in 2002 and 2003. Because of that experience, and I, I lived and worked in Southeast Asia during the SARS pandemic of 2002 and 2003, I kept tabs. I read, I read all the emails. I was asking questions. And as soon as we got back after the New Year's Eve holiday or New Year's Day holiday in 2020, the first day back at work, I sat down with my senior team actually at the very table that I'm speaking to you from right now with our clinical folks, our epidemiologists and our preparedness team to talk about what I had learned and the concerns that I had about what might be coming on the horizon. And so that activated our response. We were among the first states, for example, to put in an order for N95 masks long before anyone else did. We put in our first order in mid-January, uh, mm -hmm. two months before we had our first case. We were pushing PPE out the door to places that we knew would be vulnerable based on the experience that I had had working in Cambodia 20 years ago, places like long-term care facilities, county emergency managers. We were pushing PPE out to them weeks, if not a full month before our first case here in Maine. So I think we were prepared. Now, did I, could I have any, could anyone have foreseen one year ago what we would be contending with now? The answer is yes and no. On the yes side, we had an experience with SARS. And we, we shouldn't be surprised to know that the COVID-19 virus being even more contagious than the SARS virus would spread in the fashion that it did. So in some sense, where we are now is something that was predictable. But I think anyone who would have said that this was going to happen would have been looked at with a skeptical eye back then. Uh, the other thing that's surprising about where we are now is the fact that not even one year after the first cases in Maine, we now have three vaccines that are strikingly effective that have been approved and more on the way. So in a sense, it was unpredictable, but we shouldn't discount the amount of progress that we've made, even in a difficult situation in a year. Were there, well, I, I was gonna ask this question later, but I'll ask it now. 
was was there were there moments of personal concern, personal worry for you during all this? I think you've said that your mother was in some sort of a was living in the mid coast, maybe in some kind of a facility. I'm not sure. And um, you're a guy in your 40s, so obviously she's probably my age. Um, were there times when you were worried about her or others you're close to? Oh yes, no question about it, Don. In fact, uh, I'll even zoom out or I'll go back even a bit. Um, someone who is very close to me, who's a, a, a very close friend and colleague of mine, was uh, w w was affected by by COVID very early on in the pandemic. And this individual, uh, they live in another state, but they were very ill. They and their spouse were both very very ill. Uh, were both almost admitted to the hospital within an hour or two of both being admitted to the hospital. And uh, that early on drove home for me just how real this was. Both of them happened to also be healthcare providers. And, mm -hmm. and they told me, this is not a joke. This is a real thing. And boy, was it bad. Uh, one of them is, is still not really fully recovered uh, over a year later. Uh, so just immediately at the outset, that's one reason I was taking this very seriously from a personal note, from an empathetic perspective, because I had seen what had happened. But you mentioned my mother. I mean, you're right. She she lived with us uh, in our home with us and has uh, for uh, ever since my father passed away, pretty much. And um, she, she is someone who is uh, of an older age uh, and has health problems of her own. And so uh, I was really, really worried about her. Fortunately, she's taken the advice that I've given her, and she's really, really good about wearing a mask and avoiding others. And, and fortunately, she's been safe throughout the pandemic. But I, I will say, um, in the middle of all this, um, now that enough time has passed, and I say this with her permission, uh, in the middle of all this, uh, she fell and broke her leg. Hmm. And, um, and, and so she had to be admitted to the hospital and had to have surgery. And so uh, I was I was deeply worried about that, and uh, fortunately, everything was a okay, thanks to the healthcare providers in Maine who did an exemplary job. Uh, and I don't know if you were going to see her or not at the time, but uh, I was told that uh, by an ambulance crew that the word got around in the EMS community that a, a Rockland ambulance was pulled over on the side of the road in Thomaston one night, and you of all people pulled over and stuck your head in the ambulance to see if you could help. That's true. Yeah, gosh, You're, I had I had actually <laughs> forgotten about that. Uh, that. That is exactly right. Uh, my wife and I and our dog had gone hiking in, was it Mount Batty maybe that day? Could but be. We, we had been hiking and we were driving back. Uh, we had, uh, we had just stopped at the Lincolnville grocery store, if I recall, to pick up a pizza. And we were driving back and I saw a line of cars ahead of me. Uh, and I, I told my wife to stop. And you're right, I, I I had actually forgotten about that incident, Tom, but yep, I jumped out. EMS was already arriving on scene. I poked my head in to see if they needed any assistance whatsoever. One of the things you learn in an emergency situation is that if, you don't you don't you don't stick your head in if, if the situation is handled. You generally don't want to uh, impose yourself on a situation if there has not been a request for assistance. That holds true in just about any situation. So we stopped, we pulled over, I jogged over, asked if they needed any assistance whatsoever from any perspective. The folks who were managing the situation on site said, We're all good here. And I said, All right, gentlemen, well, here's my number and if there's anything I can do, call and we, we went on their way, but that, that's it, exactly right. It made quite an impression in the EMS world. Well, uh, you know, gosh, I don't mean to, I don't mean to minimize it, but um, I mean, this is, this is, this is what you do, right? I mean, this is why, this is why public service matters, right? And if I could have been of assistance, I would have been. The situation and scene were completely handled. So there's no need for me to interject myself because that only slows things down. But if there was a need, if they had said, boy, this is this is a bad situation, it'd be really great if you could make a call to expedite because there's people here who are in need, I, I would have done it. I mean, that's that's why you that's why jobs like this are important. Yeah. Um, was there probably there was more than one moment, but 
Was there a moment that you recall in this whole pandemic when you sort of took a deep breath and said, uh oh, we're in real trouble? Yeah, there were, Don. Uh, a couple. Um, the first among many, I, I don't want to say it was the first, but I, it was it was definitely one that I recalled was uh, when we started seeing outbreaks in greater scale than we or than I had anticipated in long term care facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you were you've been covering covid, in fact, since I think our very, very first press conference. So you've yes. you've been along for many of these. But there's one in particular that transpired early in the pandemic at a long-term care facility in Waldo County. Yeah, that Tall Pines. Made, you're right, it was at Tall Pines. And that was instructive as well as, as morose and sad. Uh, but it also made my team and I triple down on our approach to PPE, to testing, to uh, being aggressive when it came to what's now been called cohorting within a facility. Uh, we we had always been aggressive in our approach, but again, we, we went from having doubled down to tripled down on things like getting people fit tested. You may recall, Don, shortly after that, that I started reporting out on the number of people that the National Guard had been going around fit testing. Right. That was in a, I don't want to say that was a direct outgrowth of that outbreak, but it was deeply related. What we realized during that situation was, it's all good to have an N95 mask, but if someone hasn't been properly trained and fitted for it, then it's literally just sitting on the shelves. So we worked with our colleagues at the Guard to travel around the state to fit test as many healthcare providers as possible. Uh, and that was in connection with some of those early outbreaks. So that was one, one inflection point. Uh, another was around the recognition that early on, before the supplies of PPE stabilized, we were we were looking at a at a tough situation. Uh, that is around the time that my colleagues and I started making phone calls to our elected officials in Washington and elsewhere to say this is a difficult situation, and more assistance from the federal government is absolutely needed. That was the second. The, um, it's interesting you mentioned the PPE. It seems that while I don't know that we've had, at least in Maine, any true shortages or outages, I guess, it still seems that the country as a whole has not completely uh, solved this problem. Well, isn't that, you know, you're, you're, you're right, Don. And isn't that interesting? I mean, we, we talk a lot about lessons learned and what will we do better next time. But here we are in the midst of a pandemic and a year later, we still don't really have a as robust of a supply of PPE as I think any state health official would like. Now in Maine, to be fair, and to, to put everyone at ease, we're doing pretty well. Uh, we have a significant stockpile of N95 masks, as well as gloves and the swabs you use for testing. But that wasn't an accident. That was because we took deliberate steps to secure PPE from as many channels as possible. So we never had to decline a request or something of that nature. But certainly as a nation, there's still more work to be done. You've uh, talked for a minute about uh, masks, if you would. Uh, early on, uh, the, the US CDC, Dr. Fauci, yourself were, were saying that it probably didn't make sense for people to be wearing cloth masks. That changed, and then of course, as we know, we've gone to mask mandates. You've had a lot of pushback about that. Um, was some of that initial guidance probably either mistaken or ill-advised? Uh, I think some of it was was not. So here's let me let me start by saying what changed in the mask discussion, and from from an epidemiological standpoint, what changed from masks being probably not something that needed to be worn, as Dr. Fauci noted, to something that needs to be adhered to. What changed were data in March or so, late March, that showed that COVID-19 can be transmitted before people have symptoms, what we now have called asymptomatic transmission. Let me put that in perspective. If you compare COVID to the flu, the vast majority of the transmission of the flu 
happens when people are at their worst symptoms, at which time most folks are curled up in bed. What we learned from COVID, and I remember being on the call with the Deputy Director of Infectious Diseases at the US CDC, Dr. Jay Butler. I remember being on a call with Dr. Butler where he said, you know, we've just been looking at the data and it looks like the peak of infection possibility for COVID happens before people have symptoms. And almost overnight, Don, that was the game changer with respect to masks. Because if the time at which you are the most contagious is when you're, the, when you're laid up in bed, like with the flu, wearing a mask doesn't really solve anything. But with COVID, if when you are the most contagious is before you feel a single symptom, then all of a sudden a mask is critical. And overnight, in fact, I, I recall listening to that advice in the middle of the week and overnight at my next press briefing uh, w w with all of you, I remember saying, nope, this is different now. Now we know that masking actually has a role to play. And that for me was the light that changed. So was it mistaken? Only yes, in the sense that we didn't have all the data. That's science. We don't always have all the answers on day one, particularly in a pandemic. Um, and given the shortages of, of masks that we're wearing, I think it was prudent to say, we don't know. But as soon as it became clear that COVID can be transmitted before people have symptoms, almost overnight, you saw the recommendations change. They certainly did for me. Yeah. Are you surprised that there's been so much pushback against mask wearing? Um, uh, yes and no. I'm surprised in the sense that uh, it is it is for all intents and purposes at most a minor inconvenience. I, I put it on the same level as something that we all do nowadays that we don't even perceive as being an inconvenience, like wearing a seatbelt. Uh, and so in that respect, it was it was um, it was surprising. It was eyebrow raising, but of course, given at the time the political and other cultural environments that we were in, um, it's not surprising to me in retrospect that it became the flashpoint that it did. But I think it's important to note how ma how effective masks are. I mean, let's take a look at our flu numbers. We basically crash landed the flu as a country and as a state this year. Mm -hmm. no, do almost entirely because of masking and social distancing. So let's not discount the importance and the value they play. You just need to look at any of the graphs that we've seen for the flu to see the impact that it has. So having, well, before I get to that, um, with all of the outcry and complaint and protests, um, have you had uh, that criticism targeted directly at you? Have you had people leaving threatening messages, all of that kind of thing? Thankfully, no. Um, I've, I've received a fair number of, of comments and democratically, you know, a, a people pushing back and saying, I don't like this. I don't want to do this. I think it's an infringement. I understand those. And folks are, of course, this is an open democracy. We welcome that sort of feedback. I've had it. Uh, uh, folks emailing me, folks letting me know on social media. That is part of our process. And that, that is totally fine. Thankfully, um, I, I have not had, I have not been witness to or been on the receiving end of anything more than pushback from an ideological or from a, a, a political perspective. My colleagues in other states have, though. Uh, some have been uh, so troubled by the pushback they've received that they've left office, for example. Uh, fortunately, um, credit goes to the people of Maine. We can disagree in Maine and, and, and not resort to epithets and violence. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least not too much, huh? <laughs> yes. Uh, have, have there been moments of where you questioned your decisions, moments of self-doubt? Oh, of course, every single day. I mean, let, let's just be, let's, let me be very candid about that. No good leader, especially in a crisis, should ever go to bed thinking, I got everything right today, because that is not leadership in a crisis. Leadership in a crisis is evaluating every single decision to see if tomorrow you can do better at it. And my team knows that when I make decisions, I am always looking for two things. The first 
is for folks to disagree. I have a rule at my agency, which is that if there's no disagreement happening at a meeting, then why did you have a meeting in the first place? Disagreement is what allows us to get to better decisions. But the other rule that's really important is for any critical decision, I want to know in advance, what are the markers that we might be wrong? And if we are wrong, let's change course. And so every single day, Don, I'm evaluating the decisions that I made the previous day, the previous week, and trying to do better at it. Every have, there been some, some, have there been some of those that you wish you could do over? Oh, a hundred, hundreds that I wish that, that we could do better. I mean, I'll, I'll say it differently, and then I'll give you some examples. The main CDC today is a better agency than it was yesterday. And I hope that tomorrow it will be a better agency than it is today. And that's because we are always improving the way that we respond, particularly in a very fast moving pandemic. But certainly there are things that I would look to where if I knew then what I knew now, we would have made different decisions. Uh, certainly you mentioned masking as a nation, if we had all the data around transmission and contagion of COVID-19 on day one, then of course things would have been different. You don't always have that information in a pandemic on day one. Another area that uh, I think we, we, we could have done better on and that I think we're, we are doing better on with vaccines though, is around overall disparities of infections, particularly with certain racial and ethnic minority groups. Populations that have been historically affected or disaffected uh, and ways in which early on, we didn't make testing as available, we didn't communicate the severity of COVID, and we didn't make access to those services as easily accessible as they could have been. That's another area. We're hoping to not make those errors when it comes to vaccinations. But no, there are innumerable things, Don, where we're always trying to improve upon. But I guess you personally, were there are there some decisions, you, that, some things you said, wow, well, I'd really like to be able to do something different than what I did? I think the one that comes to mind for me is the way in which testing was done overall. If, if again, kind of in the, if I knew then what I knew now, we, we initially uh, had certain parameters around testing. Now, some of that was to preserve the amount of testing capacity because we had such limited capacity. But after we initially worked with IDEX, uh, to expand our capacity at the state laboratory. Uh, I think in retrospect, where I would have gone is to immediately say anyone can be tested. We eventually got there maybe two weeks later, but um, you know, at the time we wanted to reserve testing for those who were the sickest, for those who had symptoms as opposed to anybody. But again, knowing that we had the capacity, that's something I would have accelerated more quickly. Yeah. Um, the... So now we're getting people vaccinated. Actually, so I'm sorry, let me back up to a question before that I was going to ask. Have your bosses, the governor and the commissioner, have they always followed your recommendations? Um, I mean, for the, for the most part, gosh, I mean, always, no, I, it, you know, it's a, it's a collaboration. Uh, I, am, I am not the, I'm not the only person that gets a say. Uh, here's what I'll say uh, on scientific matters. For example, rules surrounding the data around quarantine and exposures or around the nature of outbreak investigations, things that are uniquely the purview of scientists, epidemiologists, clinicians, the team that I've got here at the Maine CDC. Uh, the governor has been nothing but supportive. But of course, Maine CDC is also involved in decisions that have multiple considerations, not just scientific and public health. So things like balancing the need to keep the economy going while also responding to the pandemic. That being said, uh, the decisions that, I, or the, the recommendations that I've made uh, have been very much in keeping with where the governor was to begin with. So we haven't had any situations where I was saying hard left and they were saying, no way, we're going the complete opposite direction. Mm -hmm. so, so you've generally agreed with the decisions, the restrictions, all of those? I have, yes, I have. Um, and uh, speaking, we were talking about mass a moment ago, and when will we know that we can ease up 
you and others keep saying, don't let your guard down. When will we know that we maybe can relax a little bit? We can take the mask off in public. When will well, we know? You know, you know Don, it's a, a good question. And I'll, I'll frame it this way. In the same manner in which we came to our current recommendations around things like masking and distancing, in the same manner we came to those by adjusting the dial upward as the pandemic changed its contours, we'll probably move away from them in similar fashion by dialing that knob downward. Uh, indeed, just today, the US CDC uh, recognized what, what I've been saying for a while and what, what others have been saying, which is if you're fully vaccinated and you wanna get together with others who are fully vaccinated indoors in a private home, you can gather safely without wearing a mask. Right, so that's already starting to turn the not the dial down a little bit. Um, I think, Don, as as there are there are different ways to think about when the pandemic will be over. One might be to say, well, when we achieve parity with how we think about the flu, for example, when we get the same number of cases we would have in a normal flu season, not this flu season. Another is to say, when we are below a certain number of cases per day adjusted per, for our population. There are different ways to think about what the end of the pandemic looks like. But I think what I would what I would note is that in the same way, the pandemic was not sw just automatically flipping the switch on the wall. It won't be this. It will be the same when we're talking about exiting the pandemic. There won't be a day in which I get up at a news conference and say, pandemic's over, everyone. Have a nice day. That will not happen. It will happen in similar piecemeal or gradual fashion. Do you think it'll happen this year? I, I really can't speculate. As you know, uh, you know, vaccination rates are quite robust. We are moving along at a healthy clip. That gives me hope. But even after folks get vaccinated, there too, there is a notion that as soon as we get to whatever that threshold needs to be, 70, 80, whatever percent it needs to be, that once we hit that threshold, the pandemic ends. But pandemics don't work that way. Outbreaks don't end in that manner. It's again, it's it's a little bit like that speeding train that I've analogized the situation to. Uh, there's a time between when the conductor throws the brakes on and when the train eventually comes to a halt. And that can be many, many miles. The same happens with outbreaks and pandemics. Just because we hit 80% of Mainers vaccinated doesn't mean it goes away but it starts to slow significantly. But there's uh, clearly there's going to be some moment in this when you can relax a little bit. I, I think so. And, and, and again, some of that will be for folks who are vaccinated versus those who are not. Um, but you, what, you know, what you're sort of asking is when can the general population, those who have not been vaccinated as well as those who have been, go back to the way things were before? That's harder to predict. It does depend on what our, for example, what our societal concept of risk is. How much risk are we willing to tolerate, particularly in a state that is the oldest in the nation? Are we willing to say better to ease up on those things? Or are we recognizing that there might be flare ups and outbreaks? The other thing to think about, Don, is as much as I fully recognize everyone is craving a return to normalcy, we all are, we also have to ask what that means, given that normal is what got us here. So what does normal even look like? Uh, and that's a question that as a society, we're gonna have to think about, again, particularly in a state like Maine with an older than average population. Uh, are we going to be cavalier about when we would remove mask mandates or does it pay to be a little bit more, uh, err on the side of having them around a little bit longer just to make sure our population is that safer? So, you know, you've only got a couple more minutes. I have to ask one personal question. So back last spring when you were having daily briefings and I was covering them for about two and a half months, um, you and I got into an interesting little uh, series of titles where it started off, I think you referred to me as doctor one day and it kind of took off from there. And I was, gee, I was... I was Commodore, I was Prime Minister, I was uh, Emperor Plenipotentiary or something like that various times. It was fun 
and people got quite a kick out of it. Do you recall that? And do you have any idea? Did did you consciously think of that or did it just sort of happen? You know, Don, so let me first talk about why I think things like that are, if not appropriate, at least a bit of levity, which is those were dark days. And um, my view has always been that in some situations, even when it's dark outside, a little bit of brightness is not just helpful, but can even be appropriate. Um, medical students and those who work in healthcare go through this when they're dealing with really ill patients. Um, friends of mine who have served in the military talk about the gallows humor and how that gets them through. I've, I've always been of a similar mindset, which is that the human brain can, can have multiple feelings at once. We can be sad and mournful about what's going on around us, but also smile a little bit. And so my often flat-footed or lame attempts at making some corny <laughs> dad jokes are an attempt to give everybody a little bit of space and permission to chuckle a little bit. Mm -hmm. I never joke about things that are inappropriate. I never joke right. about things on days when we had a staggeringly high number of deaths. But for me, it's a signal to say, it's okay to laugh a little bit. Now, why in particular? Here's the honest answer. I was looking at my list of folks, and for whatever reason on that first day, I something in my brain, I attached the word doctor to the beginning of your name. And I, I think it, it and, and I thought, you know, um, that's, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I, I had known you and I had worked with you enough by then to know that it was clear that you were a good sport. Uh, and that's important as well. And from then on, hey, you know, Don's a doctor today, then what can he be tomorrow? There, there, there was uh, nothing other than um, an opportunity to give folks just a little bit of an a time to crack a smile. Well, I have to tell you, 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 it worked because people would tell me, you know, I tune into that briefing every day to see what he's going to call you next. And, uh, and it did if, brighten their day. So I have something to show you here. Somehow, I haven't figured out how to physically get it to you. But my wife made these at Christmas time, which shows how on the ball I am. Uh, <laughs> she made two T-shirts with all of these names on them. And, uh, and this one is for you. So we will, uh, we will get it to you so uh, you can wear it one day without a mask. And... Uh, and, and the, as a way to celebrate, but uh, it's, uh, I enjoyed covering that every day. It was very educational and, uh, and appreciate your, your openness with everyone on this. Well, Commodore, it's always been a pleasure to have you on as well. And I've always appreciated the questions that you've raised. And uh, again, it, it's clear that you're a good sport and that's all the better relationship that we have. I think the people of Maine benefit from it. Well, I think you're right. And I've, you know, you're quoting song lyrics once in a while and some things like that too. And I think that does, that does help people a lot. And uh, so we look forward, I look forward to the day when we can do an interview face to face. Likewise, Don, likewise. I hope, and, and uh, I hope we can do it this year. <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope <laughs> so. Come me in. Thank you very much. Okay. All the best. Take care. That was great, Don. Good. Thank, thank you very much. You're welcome.